Today we'll be studying uh, World War I, and again, we'll cover the Roaring Twenties uh, next week. The Roaring Twenties. Today is World War One. Now, I imagine most of you are quite familiar with World War I because you studied it in world history. So, the first part of today's lecture is going to be a review for many of you. Uh, but you do need to understand, for example, the causes of World War I, kind of what led up to it. And then we'll start talking about the United States' role in World War I. So, to begin, folks, let's talk about the main causes of World War I, which I imagine all of you have been taught as an acronym in last year's World History class. So, quick review. The acronym M is for... Militarism. A is for? Alliance. I is for? Imperialism. N is for? Nationalism. Let's go through that. M is militarism. Back then, folks, who were the two major countries in Europe that were developing their militaries at the time? It was Germany and? Not Austria. The British. Now, if the British are building up a navy, are the Germans going to want to build up their navy? Yeah. If the Germans have a bigger navy, what are the British going to do? Make theirs bigger. And if the Germans and the British both have powerful navies, then what are the other countries going to do? They're going to build up their navies and raise their armies. So because of this arms race become between the British and the... Uh, what am I doing? And the Germans... Because of this arms race between the British and the Germans, did that lead to an arms race across all of Europe? And here's the thing. Are they going to produce all of these weapons and then not use them? No. We're going to end up using them eventually. So militarism is the first cause. Kind of like, oh, we built up this military. We're more likely to go to war now. Are we likely to go to war if we have no military? Well, look at Costa Rica. They have no army. So are they likely to go to war anytime soon? No, they have no army. They're more likely to sign treaties than go to war. <coughs> Second reason why this war was caused. The alliance system. You might remember that you have the allied powers and the central powers. The allies was a secret alliance between the British, the French, and the Russians. While the central powers was a secret alliance between the Germans, Austria-Hungary, or the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and what other empire? The Ottoman Empire. So again, you had two empires, or two alliance systems, rather secret alliances. You had the Germans, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire versus the British, the French, and the Russians. Here's why this was bad. Let's say you and I got in a fight, okay? And if you knew that, Mr. King, you're a loner, would you maybe be willing to fight me, let's say, in a dark alley one day? Sure, like, Mr. King, you have no friends. I'm going to fight you, and I'll probably win. But if you knew that I had, let's say, thousands of people willing to come to my aid in the event that I was being uh, attacked, would you be willing to fight me then? Probably not. And so here's the thing. These alliance systems are good when people know you have an alliance. The problem is when England and Germany declared war on each other, who did they think was going to be fighting in that war between England and Germany? Just England and Germany. But the second that England declared war on Russia, or I mean, Russia declared war on Germany and vice versa, all of a sudden, oh, you declared war on Germany? We will too. We'll all declare war on you. Well, we'll declare war on that guy. We'll declare war on each other. All of a sudden, it becomes as if everyone's drawn into that war. And did we know all these other people were going to be part of the war? No. So what we believe to be a standard conflict between countries became a world war because we didn't know there were alliances. They were secretive at the time. So, again, the alliance system. So again, as you know, Europe was divided. <coughs> Third reason, imperialism. What are these countries doing at the time? Imperializing. They're imperializing and they're competing to do what? An empire. Build an empire. So if they're trying to build an empire, are they going to need to have a strong military? Mm -hmm. Sure. And if you guys remember uh, the scramble for Africa back in world history, 
they have already began fighting over territories, right? This is not something new. So they've already had small skirmishes throughout the world. One really good example is the scramble for Africa. So they're already fighting for natural resources. It's kind of that same <coughs> dog-eat-dog world that America's worried about, right? That's why America became an empire, because they were worried about being taken over. The same is true for the Europeans. They don't want to be left behind. They want to have, they want to have a strong empire, too. And, of course, nationalism. Each country wants to represent their pride, their confidence, their honor. So are they going to be willing to back down in the face of a threat? No. no. Are they going to want to show off their country strength? Yeah. Definitely. And so, again, nationalism, the, their unwillingness to back down, they don't want to seem weak. That nationalism is what ultimately will help push us to war as well. Okay. Question so far? None. So these are all the long-term causes of World War I. But what was the literal spark of World War I? Yeah. The assassination of the... Yeah, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Correct. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand is kind of the powder keg or the, uh, the spark that starts this war. And who was the what terrorist group assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand? The uh, Black Hand. Good. You guys remember that part? And can anyone remember the name of the actual assassin that actually killed him? <laughs> Gavrio. Pinsip. <laughs> So again, the actual assassin is Gavrio Princip. And again, some of you may know the story of how this actually came about. But the reason why is that the Black Hand was from Serbia. <coughs> and Serbia wanted independence from Austria-Hungary, as you guys remember. And so when Serbia tried to declare independence, Austria-Hungary said no. So this terrorist group came to power. And they wanted to assassinate the Archduke. Well, their plan was to throw a bomb at his car. The problem was they threw the bomb at the wrong car. And so they didn't kill the Archduke. They said, oh, our plan is foiled. And the Archduke, who is now in the town visiting, said, we should go visit the wounded at the hospital. We feel so bad for them. So the Archduke starts driving towards the hospital. The problem was that the driver took a wrong turn, and he had to start reversing and go a different way. And as they were reversing, who happened to be walking by but Gavrio Princip, who failed to assassinate the Archduke the first time, and realized, oh, there he is. And then he shot him. So by sheer accident, by sheer accident, that's how Gavrio Princip assassinated Archduke. It was by accident. So the Great War begins, and it lasts from 1914 to 1919, a five-year war. This is the first world war in history. At that time, we call this war the Great War or the War to End All War. So again, we call this the Great War. Oh, she's not here. Uh, the Great War or the War to End All War. And we did not call it World War I until World War II. Why did we not call World War I World War I during World War I? Well, it was called the Great War, but why didn't we call World War I World War I during World War I? Because we didn't know it was World War I. We thought... This was the war to end all wars. This was when good was going to defeat evil. But during World War II, we're like, oh, we're going to do this again? Okay, you get to be World War I, we'll be World War II. <laughs> but at the time, we thought that was it. We thought, no more. No more wars. This is the greatest war of all time. Um, it turned out that it wasn't. But again, it was also a total war. What does it mean to be fighting a total war? Everyone and everything is involved, right? It's not just the soldiers is are the communities working towards the war effort. They're growing food, working in the factories. You don't have a war economy, so it's a total war. And it is a pretty expansive war because it involved 60 nations and six continents. Pop quiz, what was the only continent that did not participate in this war? Antarctica, correct, because the penguins and the seals declared neutrality during World War I. <laughs> 
They said, we don't want to take part. They wanted to make sure that they could sell Coca-Cola to everyone. <laughs> anyway, good so far? Wonderful. The cost of the war is also quite expensive. Financially, over $400 billion, which is about $10 million an hour. Very expensive war. Weapons, supplies, paying for the soldiers, the damage cost. The death toll was also very expensive, of 16 million deaths. A lot of uh, Europeans died. A lot of Americans died too, but nowhere near a million. Uh, the vast, vast majority, more than 90% of the deaths were European. Um, and the reason why the death toll was so high is that third point, or fourth point there. This is the first industrial war, this is the first war of the Industrial Revolution. Why might that be significant, that this is the first time we're fighting a war post-industrial revolution. How might war have changed? New weapons. New weapons. New types of armor. New types of technology. Is that going to drastically change the way we fight? I mean, new weapons versus old tactics of fighting. Imagine fighting today using Civil War tactics. Is that going to work? No. Can you charge on the battlefield today? Not like that. No, it's not going to work. And so... New weapons versus old style fighting really is going to shape World War One. Think of World War One as a really expensive learning process. It was a really, really expensive learning experience. Um, but that's kind of what happened here. Shall I move on? Okay. So let's talk about new types of weapon at this time. What's going to be changed as a result? First off, folks. Artillery. They're going to have artillery cannons. A R T I L L E R Y. Artillery is a new type of weapon for the most part. The idea is that these are cannons, but these are cannons that did not shoot across like uh, they did in the Civil War. They would shoot upwards and then downwards like a parabola. Why did we no longer, uh, why were we no longer just shooting straight at the enemy anymore? Because they were hiding in the trenches. Here's the cannon, right? And it shoots this way. The problem is the guy is hiding here. So are we going to hit him? And if we try to aim the cannon here, is that going to be very effective? It might just bounce off the wall. But with an artillery shell, boom! So again, it's to accommodate for the new type of trench warfare. So artillery. It allowed us to shoot into the trenches. That's why that's new. Another new type of weapon, planes. Planes were used for two main reasons during World War I. First was what? Reconnaissance. Recon. Recon or reconnaissance. Reconnaissance, folks, by the way, is just like collecting information. Recon, reconnaissance. Uh, like spying almost. The other purpose of planes was to do what? Drop bombs. Drop bombs. Now, uh, many of you guys know uh, the technology or uh, images eventually of them, like, you know, having machine guns on their planes. And what do you call it when planes are fighting in the air? <laughs> dogfighting. So eventually you will have aerial dogfighting. <laughs> but uh, at first, they didn't have machine guns on their planes because you would have to point it forward. And the problem is if you have machine guns at the front of your planes and you're firing them, what's going to happen? You're going to destroy your own blades. So they actually came up, and I keep on forgetting the name of the technology, where it's an interrupter where the blade would spin rapidly, but every time a bullet would pass through, it would stop the blade for a split second right before it passed through the gun barrel to allow the bullet to pass through between the blades. It's impressive in terms of the timing that's, a, that's required to make sure that when you're just flying like 3,000 revolutions per minute, like you're allowing a bullet to pass through every like split second or so. So it's very impressive. And eventually you have dogfighter, or like, you know, a top that you see in movies. But before that, uh, let's say you were a recon plane and another plane came to attack you. You didn't have machine guns, so you'd actually use handguns. You'd be like shooting at each other while flying your plane. It's like flybys. Like, instead of like drive-bys, you're flying by and like handgunning people. Uh, also, new invention at the time is what? Submarines. Were these really effective? Are you U-boats? Correct. U-boats. By the way, what does the, what does the U stand for in U-boat? Underwater. Underwater, but they're German, so it stands for, it's what? 
Untersea. Untersee. Untersee. Well, the underwater boats are untersea boats. Uh, they are submarines. Uh, were submarines really possible before Industrial Revolution? We kind of had them, but would they really last in battle? Because they may not like wood, right? But now, steel submarines, effective. So U-boats. <coughs> tanks were also introduced at this time. Not the tanks of World War One, mind you. Like, not as powerful, but tanks were required to cross what? No barbed wire. Uh, the barbed wire, no man's land, where all the mines were, the grenades, the bombs. And so tanks were used to kind of clear no man's land because of all that barbed wire. So tanks were really effective back then, uh, the mines, bombs, barbed wire to cross no man's land. Very effective. Here they are. And then, of course, trench warfare. Trench warfare was a new kind of warfare where people literally lived in trenches. They would have to dig in. And you guys know very much about this during World War I. You guys learned this already. But trench warfare. What caused trench warfare? Why did they have to go into the trenches? What is the main reason why these soldiers could no longer fight the way they used to? Why did they have to dig into the trenches? What changed in World War I? Yeah, what weapon? Not artillery. Machine guns. Machine guns changed the war. Because before... Let's say you're fighting in, I don't know, Spanish-American War. You have the M1 Garand. You shoot. Bang! You reload. Bang! You reload. Bang! Maybe four shots in a minute, right? But now, you can fire four bullets in like three seconds. Pa, pa, pa. Pa. <laughs> I got one. But the idea is that you can kill a lot more and shoot a lot more bullets in a small amount of time is it effective to just be standing out there during a war? No, you have to dig into the trench. And so here are people in the trenches. Again, it's for the first trenches were very narrow. They weren't wide like the later trenches in the war. And it was very uncomfortable. And you're there just to survive, not because you like it, but because you're going to die if you don't. Um, and again, here's what's between the trenches. No man's land. Bombs, grenades, barbed wire. Um, <laughs> oops. And again, uh, ideally, you would wear your helmet uh, to prevent um, getting killed. But again, the no man's land in between was just a very, very dangerous place. So we're going to go ahead and watch a clip right now from a film just to give you a better idea of what no man's land looks like. So why don't you grab the lights in the back just for a second. So no man's land, not good. The horse survives. So you know. The horse lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. FYI. In case you were like, oh my gosh. He makes it. Sorry, the horse makes it. Joey lives. He's the main character. <laughs> he is the main The whole movie's about the horse. Uh, anyway, uh, other uh, changes in trench warfare was that because people were in the trenches now, people often made use of what? Gases, poison gas, chlorine gas, mustard gas. And so we had to adopt or adapt to that by using gas masks. So gas masks were also a common uh, tool you would have. Because, again, the problem with mustard gas is that it would fill up, uh, it would uh, impact your lungs and pretty much all your membranes. Your membranes would have such a bad reaction to it, your mouth, your eyes, your nose, your lungs. And then you'd start breathing the mustard gas. It would get irritated start producing all this mucus. And then you'd start suffocating on your own mucus because your body's trying to get rid of all that mustard gas. And so you'd die of just, like, suffocation from mucus. It's not good. Uh, so, again, here are different examples of them using gas masks, machine guns, jumping over each other. So, again, the problem, though, living in the trenches is that trench warfare is disgusting. It's terrible. If it rains... Where do all those dead bodies eventually float into? The trenches, all the rotting bodies, they float into the trenches. If you're standing in water because the water's too far up, well, guess what? Your shoes, the, uh, their feet that are in your shoes and your socks will eventually start getting worn. They'll start getting cut. They'll start getting effect, infected. You'll eventually develop gangrene. They might have to amputate your feet because they start rotting. You have problems with rats and lice and, you know, uh, pests. Uh, trench foot is what they called it. You had to cut off your foot. And so, again, the situation in the trenches were not ideal by any means. It's very, very difficult. And how do you drain all that water? Not to mention the stench of all the dead bodies. Because someone dies, are you going to go and get them? No. no, he's dead. 
you're not going to risk your life to get a dead body because you're going to die too. You try if you can, but you're likely to die as well. So again, poison gas and machine guns uh, were the two types of inventions that drastically changed the war. Machine guns more than anything, though, like we said. Machine guns more than anything changed the war more than anything else because it drove people into the trenches. And were we really aware of the power of machine guns when we first developed it? No. Not really. We thought like, oh yeah, guns, faster, you know, just like other guns, but we didn't realize how much a machine gun would impact the battle. And so to give you an idea of what, who has the largest army? The Russians and the Germans, but who's not on this list? The United States, because was this our war initially? It was not. The question we must ask ourselves now is, where was America? Why wasn't America out there saving Joey, is the question. <coughs> so where was America? Well... Here's what's going on in America at the time, folks. Uh, once, uh, world, or around the time World War I broke out, Wilson was re-elected, or was elected as president. He wasn't re-elected, he was elected as president. And the Panama Canal was completed. So they're busy doing other things. And is this our war? No, this is a war of aggression between European powers. And Wilson says, yeah, we're going to declare neutrality. We don't want to be involved. This is your war. Because are we going to gain one way or another from this at all? No. This is their war. Let them handle it. <coughs> at the very end, we might just trade with whoever is the stronger power at the end. But we don't have anything to gain from this. So this is their war. So we declare neutrality. And also a big part of it, according to this cartoon, is what? <coughs> they don't want their sons and you know husbands to go fight off in the war. So why am I going to risk American lives to fight in your war? Don't we make the same argument today? Yeah. Why do we have to worry about other people's wars? Today it's different, but back then, it really wouldn't have affected us. Today, it still matters. Anyway, so again, we promoted a sense of American isolationism. We did not want to get involved. And again, was Wilson's foreign policy one of intervention? Did Wilson want to intervene in his foreign policy? No. He did when he had to, but did he want to intervene? <laughs> No, he didn't. And so he doesn't want to get involved. This is not our war. So he promotes isolationism. Let them handle it. This is not our problem. <coughs> and instead, we have Wilson declare neutrality. So we have Wilson's neutrality proclamation. Again, here's roughly what it says. His neutrality proclamation said, The effect of the war upon the United States will depend upon what American citizens say and do. Every man who really loves America will act and speak in the true spirit of neutrality, which is the spirit of impartiality and fairness and friendliness to all concerned. The people of the United States are drawn from many nations, and chiefly from the nations now at war. It is natural and inevitable that there should be the utmost variety of sympathy. Some will wish one nation, others another, to succeed in the momentous struggle. So looking at the second paragraph, read it quietly to yourself. According to Wilson, why does he think we should not declare war here? And go ahead and grab the lights again. <coughs> but again, read this quietly to yourself real quick. According to Wilson, why shouldn't we declare war? So read that to yourself, and I'll call on someone. Fifteen seconds. Why shouldn't we declare war? What is his argument? Okay, let's go with uh, Jasmine. What do you think? Why should we uh, not declare war? What do you think? There's many people from those countries, and do we have people from each of those countries? Probably. So why probably should we not declare war? Not necessarily our, our alliances with those other countries, but think about back at home. Uh, in this classroom, how many of you guys are have family in Mexico? 
How many guys have family in Latin America but not Mexico? Okay, so name a country that's not Mexico and Latin America that you have family in. Huh? Guatemala. So if Mexico and Guatemala went to war, should we declare war? Should we choose a side? If we choose a side, will some people in this classroom be upset? Yes. Well, if we choose the other side, will other people be upset? So the concern that we have is we shouldn't declare war because it'll divide our country. Do we have German Americans? Do we have British Americans? Yes. Do we have Russian Americans? Yes. If we declare war, we're going to divide our country. So we don't declare war. Because our country is made up of all of their people. So we don't declare war to avoid conflict, to avoid a divided country. We don't want to divide our country, our population. <coughs> Which is pretty smart because naturally, who would have we sided with? British, right? We have a much longer history with them. But we said, no, no, impartial. We want to stay out. And by the way, we get to benefit from this war. How do we as a country get to benefit from a war that we're not fighting in? What do we get to do? We get to sell everything to them. So U.S. policy before World War One or before our entrance to World War One was, again, according to this cartoon, war, ammunition for sale, orders filled promptly. What are we looking to do during this war? Supply them. We're going to sell them. You guys need, oh, we have tons of bullets. You need guns? We have guns. We're not using any of them. Yeah, we'll sell them to you. <coughs> so we believed we had the right to trade with warring nations. And that those warring nations should respect that we as a country are what? We're neutral. They should respect our neutrality. Because we're not, we're not attacking anyone. So if we're a neutral country, who are we allowed to trade with? Everyone. We can sell guns to you and sell guns to you. And it'll be great. And we'll double the sale of guns. That's what we're looking to do. We want to double it. And we believe in the freedom of the seas. <clears throat> Unfortunately... Uh, yeah, no one recognized our uh, neutrality. This is like before, right? Remember when we tried to declare neutrality in uh, the French and uh, British uh, conflicts? Yeah, they didn't recognize neutrality either, but we tried. We tried to declare neutrality, but no one listened. So, uh, are the Germans okay with us trading with the British? <coughs> no. Are the British okay with us trading with the Germans? No. no. So the British, unhappy with us trading with the Germans, they set up a British blockade. The idea being, if the U.S. wants to trade with Germany, what are the British going to do? How are they going to stop us? Because what's a blockade, folks? Yeah, they're going to set up like ships to block us from trading with the Germans. So the British set up a British blockade. And here's what happens to trade with the Central Powers in Germany. Before, in 1914, we were trading $70 million in trade with the Central Powers. $70 million, pretty, pretty big. Once the British blockade was enacted, though, in which the British tried to prevent us from trading with the Germans, the... Austro-Hungarians, the Ottomans. Here's what happened to German and Central Power trade. It declined to 1.3 million. So was the blockade effective? Yes. Very much so. And here's the thing. If we can't trade with the Germans, who are we probably trading with? The Allies. The Allies and the British. So while our trade with the Central Powers has declined, our trade with the Allies has grown from 825 million to 3.2 billion. So while we dropped a 70th in trade with the Allies, we quadrupled our trade with the uh, Allies. So is the blockade effective? Definitely. Now, who thinks this is unfair? 
the Germans, the Central Powers, saying, wait, that's not fair. You're neutral. You're supposed to be trading with both people. Why are you not upset at the British? Now, technically, we are upset, right? We, we don't like the fact that we can't trade with the, with the Germans anymore. But again, let's compare 3.2 billion to 70 million. Is it really hurting our wallet? No, we're actually gaining from this. So we're upset because we don't like our neutrality being attacked by the British, but we're kind of okay with it. But again, like you said, the Central Powers and the Germans are not happy with this British blockade. So how do the Germans respond to the British blockade? How do they say, hey, well, if you can't trade with the Germans, we're not going to let you trade with the British. And what do the Germans do to stop us from trading with the British? They don't set up a blockade. Instead, what they do is they send out the German U-boats. And they begin what is known as unrestricted submarine warfare. Now, the reason why they call it unrestricted is that before, submarines were only allowed to shoot down what kind of ship? A warship, a battleship. But with unrestricted submarine warfare, what are they allowed to sink? Any kind of ship. Fishing vessel, passenger ship, merchant ship, uh, bathtub toys, whatever. Okay. It's unrestricted now. They can sink whatever they want if they want to. Now, of course they're going to sink warships, right? But why did they say they had to start sinking passenger ships, for example? They're carrying people. Why did they say we still have to sink it? Yeah, it might still be carrying weapons, right? Sure, you have the top of the ship that's carrying, you know, like people. But in the cargo hold, what might they be carrying? Guns, weapons, bombs. So they said, I understand that we don't want these people to die, but it's not fair that the British are using these people as shields. They're lying. They're, they're, they're tricking you. So it's, we can't just let this cargo you know, arrive in England because you're not letting them trade with us because you're blo the British are blockading. And so uh, the Germans begin unrestricted submarine warfare and they begin to test America's patience. Now, do the Germans want America to join this war? No, they don't. They don't want America to join the war. Now, ideally, they'd want America to join on their side, but America's probably not going to do that. So here's what happens. The Germans sink the Lusitania. It was unrestricted submarine warfare, which is a passenger ship. Is it a warship? Nope. No. And they kill about 1,260 people. 1,260 people die on this ship. And unfortunately, of the people that die on this ship, this is a British ship, by the way, who else is killed? Americans are killed. Now, who is not happy about these Americans being killed? The United States. Now, might the Americans declare war here? Americans have just been killed by the, by the Germans. So the Germans, do they want America to go to war? They say, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. We apologize. We did not know there were Americans on that ship. Had we known, we would not have sunk it. We are so sorry. Please forgive us. Now, does America want to go to war? No, we don't want to go to war either. We're isolationists. We want peace. So reluctantly, Wilson says, Germany. You can't do this again. You killed Americans. We know you're sorry. It was an accident. But don't do it again. I have angry families demanding war. I'm going to calm them down. But don't do it again. And Germany says, you're right. We apologize. We're sorry. We won't do it again. Okay? But again, does America want to go to war? Does Germany want America to go to war? No. So they both apologize. America accepts because they want to avoid war as best they can. And in that war, again, here's a newspaper that happened when it sank. So America goes, okay, fine. Don't do it again, Germany. Well, uh, they do it again. And they sink the Arabic this time. And again, the Germans sink another passenger ship called the Arabic. And again, American lives are lost. And Wilson says, Germany, we talked about this. You've killed more American lives. I have angry families demanding war. And Germany says, sorry, 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 sorry. We apologize again. We're so sorry. Here's what we're going to do. We promise from now on with the Arabic pledge on the lives lost. From now on, 
we will not sink any non-military ship without giving them 30 minutes notice. They're still going to sink the ship, but they're going to warn them 30 minutes beforehand. Why? So they can get off the ship and we won't risk America. We won't risk lives anymore. But why do they still need to sink the ship? It's probably still carrying weapons, guns, bombs, whatever else. So he said, look, we're not trying to kill the people and we're sorry that that happened. But again, it's the British fault. They're the ones using these human shields, but we're going to sink the ship but we promise in the future we'll warn them. So we're sorry. Please forgive us. We're so, so sorry. Wilson says, okay, fine. Okay? But don't do it again, Germany. Okay? I, I, we can't have this. Germany's like, okay, we promise not to do it again. Germany's like, okay, fine. And again, are we happy we stayed out of war? Are the Germans happy we stayed out of the war? Everyone's happy. Except for the lives lost. Then, they did it again. And they sink the Sussex. And again, Wilson says, Germany! We talked about this on two occasions already. We've said, don't sink these ships. I have angry families demanding war. This is the third time. You know how jingoist my country is? Yes, they want to be isolationist, but you're killing innocent Americans. Germany says, sorry, sorry, sorry. We are so, so sorry. Okay, you got it. No more submarine warfare. No more. We promise. No more and again, what Germany decides to do is they limit unrestricted submarine warfare. They say, we won't sink any more passenger ships. Scouts honor. We're done. And America says, okay, Germany, but no more. <laughs> Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on you. <laughs> Fool me three times, still shame on you. But fool me four times, shame on me but it'll be like the fifth and sixth time until we actually do it. Did they, did they, they warned a few for a while, but they didn't warn the Sussex. They just sank it straight out again. So again, they did for a time keep the Arabic pledge. They would warn ships ahead of time, but again, was it that productive? They wait, we have to warn them Give them 30 minutes, and in the time that we're waiting for them to disembark, a British ship can come and sink us. Right? So they said, that's stupid. So let's just keep sinking them again. But again, they say, okay, fine. We don't want America to go to war. So Germany gets their way because America gets to stay isolated. And everyone's happy. Okay? So, but is America tense now? Some people, are they beginning to demand war? Like, hey, those are American lives. We're just going to ignore that? But we'll say, look, it's... It's a few lives compared to millions. So let's, let's keep a cool head. They said they're sorry. We'll get reparations. It'll be fine. But then things got more complicated. The Zimmerman note. <coughs> what was the Zimmerman note? Who can tell me what the Zimmerman note was? Okay, Abel. Very good. The Zimmerman note was a secret telegram sent from Germany to Mexico. <coughs> the Zimmerman note was a secret telegram sent from Germany to Mexico. And this is the actual telegram right here. It's coded, but we decoded it. And when we received the telegram, we decoded it. And uh, here's what it said. So we'll read it first, this secret uh, telegram from Germany to Mexico. Let's read it, and then you tell me what it says. On the 1st of February, we intend to begin unrestricted submarine warfare. In spite of this, it is our intention to endeavor to keep neutral the United States of America. So one, what are we going to start doing again? Submarine, submarine warfare. We're going to start sinking passenger ships. What do we expect to happen? He wants to join. No, what do we expect America to do? Stay neutral. They're probably going to stay neutral again because they were neutral before. They were neutral the last three times. Are they probably going to be neutral again? Yeah. At least we hope so. We're going to try to keep them neutral. But if this is not successful, 
We propose an alliance on the following base with Mexico, that we shall make war together and together make peace. We shall give general financial support, and it is understood that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. The details are left to you for settlement. So, if America does go to war, what does Germany want Mexico to do? They want Mexico to declare war on the U.S. In exchange for winning, what does Mexico get? Yeah, what do we call this land? What's that land that we call it? They get the Mexican cession back. Now, does Mexico want that back? Almost oh, definitely. They definitely want that back. And, so, and Germany knows that. So Germany says, if you declare war in America, we will give you back the Mexican cession. Now Mexico's intrigued. Like, oh, okay. Something to consider. You are instructed to inform the president of Mexico of the above in the greatest confidence as soon as it is certain that there will be an outbreak of war with the United States and suggest that the president of Mexico on his own initiative should communicate with Japan suggesting adherence at once to this plan. At the same time, offer to mediate between Germany and Japan. So what else does, do we want Mexico to do? Bring Japan into the war. Now, don't just declare war. See if Japan will declare war on America. Let's have them have a say, too. Please call to the attention of the President of Mexico that the employment of ruthless submarine warfare now promises to compel England to make peace in a few months. So, they make this proposal, and they say, you should totally do this. Why? What's the last thing that he's saying? that they're probably going to win in just a few months. Hey, we're going to start submarine warfare again, and we're going to defeat the British in just a few months. We're going to win. So it's win, win, win. How could you not agree to this, Mexico? We're going to defeat them in a few months. You get to declare war in America. We're probably going to defeat them, and you get the Mexican session. Why not do this? And so this is what the Zimmerman note said. Now, here's the thing. Yes, it was a secret telegram, but it was intercepted by the British, who gave it to the Americans. The Americans say, oh, okay. Okay, I see what's happening here. But was this enough to get America to declare war? No, not yet. Because this is a secret telegram. We have to say, Mexico, do you get any telegrams from Germany? Just asking, just to see, you know, like, were they going to admit to it? Um, they did. Here's the actual telegram. But what really ultimately forced us to go to war, because this was upsetting, and we were like, we're probably going to go to war. But what ultimately resulted in us going to war, and again, here's Germany telling Mexico, we're going to give you the land back, <laughs> is Germany resumes unrestricted submarine warfare. So again, they send a Zimmerman note, and they begin submarine warfare again. The question is why? Knowing that America is probably going to be upset, and knowing that America has probably found the Zimmerman note. The question is, why would they risk America being mad? Well, there's three major reasons why. America, they didn't care if America got upset. <coughs> Number one, they resumed unrestricted submarine warfare because they believed they would win. They believed they were going to win. Number two, they assumed America would declare neutrality. So they thought they would win. Two, they assumed America would declare neutrality. Isn't that crazy for them to think? No, they did it the last three times. So they said, one, we're going to win anyway. Two, you're probably not going to do anything anyway. But three, even if America declares war, if I declare war today with Germany, Am I going to be able to send my army to German shores today? No. It's going to take me weeks to mobilize my army. So third, they knew that America could not mobilize immediately. America could not mobilize immediately. And by the time America was ready to go to war, what would have probably already happened in Europe? 
Germany would have won, we would have repelled the American forces, and America would have wasted their time. So they believed that America could not mobilize their war, um, army in time. So, do we have anything to lose? No. We're probably going to win. America probably will declare neutrality, and even if they don't, we're going to have one by the time they get here. So in our minds, did we have anything to lose? If you're a German, let's do it. Let's win the war. Because what's America going to do? America defeated Spain. Is Spain, Germany, or England? No. So what do we have to worry about? America is a small country. They don't have that powerful of an army yet. They have a navy, sure, but are the navies going to walk on land? No. So what do we care about? No real risk. So they begin unrestricted submarine warfare. They sink these ships, and then they sink more ships. And then because of that, America decides, oh, yeah, we're going to war. When German submarines sank three more American ships in a one-month span in March 1917, Wilson says, all right, you fooled me like five times. Let's go to war. And Wilson asked Congress to declare war in March 1917. And America enters World War I. So again, the Zimmerman note is not the cause of World War I. Neither is the sinking of the Lusitania. It's the resumption of submarine, unrestricted submarine warfare that really does result in us entering World War I. <coughs> Questions or comments? None? Okay. What are we fighting for is the question then. What is the purpose of our fight? Why have we entered this war is the question. Well, folks, this is our moral crusade. We are going to fight. Are we fighting for power? No. Are we fighting to expand an empire? We're fighting because it's the right thing to do, right? We're fighting to protect lives. And so our moral crusade includes the following. This is the war to end all wars. We're doing it to defeat evil, to punch it right in the face. That's why we're going to war. The war to end all wars. And isn't that like such a dramatic thing to be doing? Yeah. We're going to do it to end all the bad things. Probably to defeat cancer too and heart disease and <laughs> lymphoma. It'll be great. We must make the world safe for democracy. It was said in a speech. The world must be safe for democracy. So we have to defeat these dictatorships. America, the great democracy, will tackle the evil dictatorships of Germany. And we will survive. And we will win. We have to defend human rights of all those innocent Europeans being killed on the battlefield and all those people killed on those merchant ships. We have to defend their rights. Who's going to protect them? We have to defend our trade, our neutrality, and our freedom of the seas. We have the right to trade, and we have to protect that. We did nothing wrong, and we were attacked. And so we deserve the right to defend our rights. By the way, just real quick, this idea of freedom of the seas, this is why we're attacking the Germans, but why didn't we do it against the British, right? Because did the British recognize our neutrality? No, they were blockading our ships, and yet we're like, hey, stop that. But again, they didn't kill anyone, so that's probably why. Uh, we also want revenge for the Lusitania, the Arabic, and the Sussex. We said we had to avenge those that were lost by you know, the cold-blooded murders of Americans. And lastly, we're kind of upset about the Zimmerman note. Like, really, Germany? Letters behind my back? Not okay. I like to imagine the Zimmerman note is like a letter you would give to like ask someone out to the dance. It's like, will you go and join war with me? Yes or no? And it like, makes sense to like color it in and then give it back. But then, like, the girl finds out the girl's American. It's awkward. But America declares war, and Germany's response is, I dare you to come. Did we expect America to be able to defeat the Germans? Like you said, did the Germans think they won the war already? So they said, go ahead, America, bring your honor and your law and your freedom of the seas and your morality. Bring them. My U-boats are waiting to sink them to the ground. Because remember, they have submarines. We sailed across the ocean. 
And so Germany says, bring it on. I've already pretty much defeated the British. Russia bailed out of the war a while back. We're going to win this. So I dare you to come. And America says, huh, okay. Okay, we'll come. So, let us talk about World War One and the home front. So there are two parts of this war that we will discuss. There is the war front, where all the fighting took place, and then the war front. Stuff that happened here in America during the war. You guys are very familiar with the war front, because that's what world history really focuses on. Our purpose is to discuss the home front and what America did to prepare for the war, to make sure we won the war. That's what we're going to be talking about here. Cool. Ready? Okay. The home front. Here we go. First off, in order to win this war, folks, we need public support. Are we going to win the war if the people don't support it? No. So, for example, uh, today, like the war in uh, Syria. Did we go to war in Syria? Do we have troops in Syria today? No, we don't. We want to be there. A lot of people want to be there. Obama would like to be there. But do we have public support to fight in another war? No, we don't. But in order to fight in World War I, we needed public support. And so the Committee on Public Information was created, CPI. Their job was propaganda. And it was led by George Creel, which was why it's sometimes called the Creel Commission, or CPI. George Creel's job was, again, to promote the war, American patriotism and public support. Uh, they would do things like create propaganda posters, defend your country, and destroy this mad brute. Would we portray the Germans as civilized people? No, his job was to create the sense of anger and frustration. Uh, many ways that he did this, uh, he created the um, the flag on every lawn campaign. You have to put a flag in every lawn to show your support for the war. If you don't have a flag on your lawn, be like, what, do you hate America? Put a flag on your lawn. Clearly that shows you support the war. So flag on your lawn campaign. Um, another key type of propaganda was propaganda films. So here we have a film uh, showing a German uh, abusing an American nurse, and you'll get a sense of maybe how you would feel if you're watching this in the theater. So here's a film about a German uh, abusing a uh, American nurse. seem that upset about her baby being done. She's like, oh no. <laughs> like, he just threw your baby out of window. He's like, oh nuts. I have to get another one. Uh, but no, if you're watching that, wouldn't you be like pretty upset? Like, the Germans are doing that? They're throwing babies out windows and burning down cities? That's terrible. And so they would use these propaganda films to encourage people to declare war. Uh, they would also play uh, songs to encourage people to go to war. Uh, the most uh, famous song or the anthem of World War I was over there. So let's play a bit of that. Uh. So you have to imagine like, it's more like a marching song. It's a theme song for uh, the war. Uh, 
If you know the words, sing along. Get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Johnny, show the hun you're a son of a gun. Hoist the flag and let her fly. Yankee doodle, do or die. Pack your little kit, show your grit, do your bit. Yankees to the ranks from the towns and the tanks. Make your mama proud of you and the old red, white, and blue. And then you have over there. It's a good song. It's catchy. So again, they would play the song, and people would like sing it, and be like, ah, over there. We're going to go over there, and we're going to defeat them, and we're not going to come back till we're done over there. Uh, another campaign they used was the Beat the Huns campaign. The Huns, if you guys remember from world history, were like the Mongols, the Huns. They were like savage and like cannibals, and they murdered a lot of people. We said, the Germans are just like the Huns. They murdered people, and they're terrible, and they're uncivilized. Like this cartoon. Look at it. What do you see? There's a bloodied knife, bloodied hands, two bloodied knives, uh, swords and a knife, and then there's uh, dead children. I think he has a cold, though. His nose is red. I don't imagine like, he shoved his nose into the dead children. I think he just, like, he's, he's been sneezing a lot, and he's, he's, he's sick. Again, Lady Liberty's going to war. Why aren't you? So they would use that type of a campaign. She's charging into battle. Uh, and again, like this picture on the right, if we don't stop the war in Europe, what might happen? Yeah, the war might come to our shores. They might burn down the Statue of Liberty. They might destroy New York. And so we have to make sure we end this war or the world will perish. The world must be made safe for democracy. Take up the sword of justice, Lady Liberty says. And enlist. And in this cartoon on the right, again, what's being suggested here? Why should we enlist? What are they trying to remind you of in this? In this? Yeah. The, the sinking of Lusitania. This is a drowning woman and her child saying, enlist for them. These people died. Are we going to let them die for nothing? No. Enlist. Yeah. So again, would you say that the propaganda was pretty good? Songs, posters, movies, everywhere. Just propaganda everywhere. Flags can be reminded not having one. Uh, again, now too, now we have public support. we got to mobilize the country for war. Now, what does it mean to mobilize the country? To prepare, to get them ready. So to mobilize the country means to get the country ready for war. If you mobilize your troops, you're getting your troops ready. To mobilize the country means to prepare the country for war. And so one of the industries or uh, the administrations we created to promote uh, mobilizing the country is the War Industries Board. 
And the Ward Industries Board was led by Bernard Baruch, or Bernard Baruch, I don't know how to pronounce it, I think it's Baruch. Uh, Bernard Baruch. And Bernard Baruch's job was to regulate raw materials, was to regulate raw materials. Now, why would he have to regulate raw materials in the country? Yeah, to make sure that all the raw materials are being used for the war effort. Do we want to be using raw materials to be making, I don't know, toy guns? Do we want to be using steel to be making wagons for kids? No. We want to use all that steel for the war effort. Instead of, you know, making whoopee cushions for children, we should be using it to make tires for the tanks or for the jeeps. Does that make sense? So we want to make sure that we are regulating the raw materials. And their other job was to convert the consumer economy into a war economy. Their job was to convert the consumer economy into a war economy. To convert the consumer economy into a war economy. So one example would be uh, toy guns. Are we going to keep a toy gun factory open during the war? No. 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 Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to convert it. So we're going to take that toy gun factory and convert it so that what? It can make real guns. Like putting plastic, we'll put steel, and we'll start you know, making steel guns. You know, we might you not know, shut down a spoon and fork factory and convert it into a bullets making factory. Does that make sense? So we're going to take a consumer economy that sells random crap to the people and say, nope, we're now going to go ahead and take all of that and convert it to uh, making war goods, bullets, uh, jeeps, planes, that kind of thing. And so again, here's a woman, for example, making an axle to a, a tank. And again, why are women working here now? All the men are uh, many of the men are off fighting in the war. Very good. Uh, here are them building artillery shell, and we're going to launch that kid in space. Uh, he's going to be a spy, so we're going to launch him in German lines. And it'll be entertaining. Uh, and again, what's suggested by this cartoon? Hmm? Everyone's going to war, but more importantly, what? What is the focus of this cartoon? Beatrice? They're happy, yes. They're definitely happy. But what is the argument of the cartoon? Besides just telling me, huh? That they're all working together and that who is just as equal as who? But who is just as equal to who? The workers are just as important to the war efforts as the soldiers themselves. Does that make sense? It's not the soldiers standing up front and they know that the workers are laying back down. Because were there men that did not fight in the war? Yeah, there were men that stayed here. So the argument that we had to make was you workers are just as important as the army men and the navy men. That way you don't feel depressed and you have a role to play too. So again, that the workers were just as important as the men was something they tried to keep on promoting. So now we have the war uh, economy converted. The next thing we have to do is to make sure we have enough what for the troops? Food. food. So we create the U.S. Food Administration, which is led by Herbert Hoover, who will eventually be president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Herbert Hoover. Now, the U.S. Food Administration's job was to encourage people to eat less wheat and meat. Their job was to encourage people to eat less meat and wheat. So that what? So you can use it for the soldiers. Yeah, we can send it overseas. So again, our goal was to encourage Americans to eat less wheat and meat. Uh, we used gimmicks to do this. Uh, one of the gimmicks was meatless Mondays. Meatless Mondays and wheatless Wednesdays. So meatless Mondays, wheatless Wednesdays to help people remember. Meatless Mondays, wheatless Mondays, my favorite taco Tuesdays. But they didn't do that. But anyway, wheatless Wednesdays, meatless Mondays. They also encouraged all Americans to grow victory gardens. Victory gardens. Why would they encourage Americans to grow their own victory gardens? Yeah, so instead of farms producing for you and your family, you can produce for you and your family, and the farms can sell all their goods to the soldiers. So victory gardens. And why are they called victory gardens? Not just like 
gardens. They were assuming they were going to win. They're going to help win the war with these gardens. Um, La Ponte High School, for example, had our own victory garden. We grew victory gardens during the war. Definitely. Yeah, guys, remember, this school was built in 1915, which means this war, the school participated in World War I, which I'll show you images of later. We'll get to that. Uh, anyway, uh, so the other thing that they tried to do to save uh, wheat was they helped pass what amendment to make sure that we reduce our use of wheat for this. Yeah, they, they banned this so we could use wheat for bread. Ah, so they also helped promote prohibition. Remember how he said that uh, alcohol was un-American? Mm. This is what they did. Alcohol is un-American. We're fighting a war. You shouldn't be drinking. We need that wheat for bread. So again, prohibition was also another way. So wheatless Wednesdays, meatless Mondays, victory gardens, prohibition. Here are several posters that you might encounter during World War I to encourage you to do your job as an American. Uh, again, here's a list of all the days. Wheatless Mondays and Wednesdays and meatless Mondays and all meals are wheatless on Wednesdays and Fridays is one meal wheatless but one meal wheatless and then Saturdays are all meals porkless. You have porkless Saturdays. And so they tried to regulate as best they could. But now again, keep in mind also, this is all voluntary. There is no rationing. I should make that very clear. There is no rationing where you can only eat this much. They're encouraging you to only eat less. But do you have to eat less? No. No. Like if you want to eat all the wheat you can, that's your choice. But people will, you know, hate you for it. But it's not required. Not yet. Not until World War II. They say you should eat more cottage cheese instead of eating uh, cows or pigs or sheep. Because what can we do with the cows, pig, and sheep? Yeah, we can take the meat and feed the troops, and you'll get just as much protein from cottage cheese. So eat less meat and eat cottage cheese. Uh, housewives, save your fats for explosives. So again, after you're cooking those eggs, save the fat, put it in a little container, bring it to your meat dealer, and they're going to convert that into uh, explosives. So do that. In her wheatless kitchen, she's doing her part too. Instead of eating wheat, she's eating corn. Because corn is much uh, harder to uh, keep. So corn we can eat on a daily basis, whereas corn won't last on the battlefield. So wheat will last, corn won't. So we eat the corn, the soldiers eat the wheat. Uh, don't waste bread. Save two thick slices every day and defeat the U-boat. So whenever you're slicing that bread, put two away. End of the week, you got a whole loaf of bread. Everyone wins. The kitchen is the key to victory. So do your part. We eat because we work. We belong to the U.S. School Garden Army. So even little kids were performing and working in the U.S. School Gardens. Uh, so they would grow their own food and take it home that day. You know, we did it here. Uh, the baseball field today used to be a huge farm. La Puente used to have a uh, FFA. Uh, we had a Future Farmers of America program here a uh, long, long time ago. Because this used to be all farmland. So it's so farms here. Uh, the National War Garden Committee. So again, we encourage everyone. We even give books away for free to teach people how to grow gardens. Uh, save the products of the land. Eat more fish. Fish feed themselves. You know, we have to feed cows, but fish, they just like appear. <laughs> Clearly, we didn't understand how fish work. But the idea was, at least fish, they do produce. We have to be like, hey, fish, grow. They're just fish. So there's, the ocean's huge. So we figured we'll eat fish, and they'll last, and no animals, they take a long time. Eat rabbits. Rabbits, they reproduce like crazy. So you, uh, rabbits are actually not that bad, folks. I've had rabbit before. It's not like my choice of food, but you know what? It's not terrible. It's not... It's too small. It's like you want, I want like a giant rabbit, like chicken legs. <laughs> rabbit legs is small. not sufficient. But the idea is that rabbits eat, have, they have 12 kids a year, which equals 45 pounds of meat. So eat rabbits because they have tons of kids a year. Whereas cows, how many kids do they have a year? Like half. And then the next year they'll have the other half and then they'll have full cow. It's crazy. <laughs> Let the hen whip the Kaiser. So, you don't eat chicken because the chicken will help us win the war. Uh, food will win the war. You came here seeking freedom. You must not help to preserve it. Wheat is needed for the allies. Waste nothing. Who is this aimed at? Immigrants. Immigrants. Hey, you came here for freedom. Help us keep it. Don't eat wheat. <laughs> save money the easy way. Grow gardens. Thrift each patriotic plan today. And you save money, right? <laughs> food, buy it with thought. Cook it with care. Serve just enough. Save what will keep. Eat what would spoil. Homegrown is best. Don't waste it. 
Little Americans, do your bit. Eat oatmeal, cornmeal, mush hominy, or other corn cereals, but don't eat wheat and leave nothing on your plate. Eat uh, cane syrup and molasses. Don't use sugar. Syrup, molasses and cane syrup is already liquid form. Sugar is dry and easy to transport. So again, if you're going to flavor your pancakes, don't put sugar, I guess. Do you leave sugar on the pancakes? I use it by an example. Uh, don't put sugar in your oatmeal. Use syrup, which is actually pretty awesome. I've been doing that recently. Uh, don't waste food while others starve. Again, you know, like they're like, don't eat everything on your plate. Well, over here, people are starving. Uh, what are you doing? The Kaiser's can can food. Why should you can your food? To help it last, right? Follow the Pied Piper. Join the U.S. School Guard and Army. I would put like an asterisk. Don't follow strange men. Because I would be worried this is encouraging the wrong idea. Uh, Raise pigs and to help win the war. So we did this. We would raise pigs here in La Puente and we'd send them off to the war. Not to fight, to feed the troops. Uh, save a loaf a week, help win the war. Eat more corn and oats and rye products. Eat less wheat, meat, sugar, and fats. Be patriotic, sign your country's pledge to save the food. I mean, are there tons of these? Lots. And you are bombarded saying, hey, are you eating meat today? Because you shouldn't be. Do your part. Food is ammunition. Don't waste it. Help your boy at the front. Use less wheat and meat. Send more to him. That's our fuels for fighters. There's a lot. To also mobilize the country for war. Now that we're saving food for the soldiers, what else does our army need to survive, to win, to succeed? They need fuel. And so, the fuel administration was led by Harry Garfield. And the fuel administration's job was to conserve gasoline and coal. The purpose was to uh, conserve gasoline and coal for the war. Primarily what they would do is they would close non-essential factories. So for example, the whoopee cushion factory, non-essential. They would close non-essential factories, like the whoopee cushion factory, non-essential. Um, Gimmicks that they used, very similar to uh, the Food Administration. Uh, gasless Sundays. Gasless Sundays, so don't run the gas on Sundays. Okay, you know, uh, put on a blanket, put on a sweater, but don't turn on the heat. Heatless Mondays, same thing. Heatless Sundays, don't turn on the gas. I guess gasless Sundays is more like don't cook your food, eat like vegetables. Heatless Mondays, lightless Tuesdays, go to bed early. When the sun is done, go to bed. No, don't stay up late. Conserve, because that burns coal. So, lightless Tuesdays. Also, daylight savings. Why do we have daylight savings, folks? It saves electricity, but why? Because in the winter, what happens to the day? It gets dark quicker, and the days begin much earlier. So, instead of going to work when it's already really bright and coming home when it's dark, they shifted the day up to accommodate the change in the season. So now do you get to work more during the sunlight? That's why we did it, to conserve energy, so that you're not working in the factory using lights, you're still using natural light. Make sense? So that saves a lot of energy as well. So folks, uh, we save gasoline, it's a war necessity. And of course, light consumes coal, save light, save coal. So again, everyone good on the fuel administration? All good things. Huh? The yellow press, yeah, I mean, the press was encouraged to promote the war. And, of course, the yellow press wanted this war. And uh, they would give suggestions. They would help uh, direct the war. Because, again, the yellow press, they were also somewhat patriotic. They like America. Uh, so they want America to win at everything. Uh, so you have that going on. Light consumes coal. Save light, save coal. So everyone got on the fuel administration. Okay. So we've gained propaganda. People support the war. We got them food. We got them fuel. Now we have to uh, give them coal. And now, what else do we have to do? we got to pay for the war. So, who's responsible for paying the war? The U.S. Treasury Department. So, what's one obvious way just to gain money quickly? What do we always do if we need money? Well, what do we do today if we need more money, for example, the school? What do we do? Yeah, we increase taxes. So, the first thing that we did, we increase taxes... And we earned $10 billion. It's a lot of money. But the other thing we asked people to do 
was to buy what? To buy war bonds or liberty bonds. No, both. To buy war bonds or liberty bonds. We've talked about bonds before. Uh, but again, just to clarify, a bond is like you loaning the government money. Normally, the government loans you money, right? But a bond is the reverse. You're going to loan the government $10 today. I'll pay you back 12 in the future. That's a bond. You're loaning the government money because do we have the money today? But I'm good for it. I'll have it next week. That's the idea. So this end up, ends up raising $23 billion. So where did most of the money come from? The people. War bonds. So campaigns to buy war bonds beat back the Hun with liberty bonds. Boys, do your duty. For victory, buy more bonds. You buy a liberty bond, lest I perish. Goodbye, Dad. I'm off to fight for glory. You buy U.S. government bonds or I'll kill you. Uh, help crush the menace of the seas by liberty bonds. Keep him free by stamps. Hello, this is Liberty speaking. Billions of dollars are needed and needed now by Liberty Bonds. Before sunset, before the day is out, go buy Liberty Bond today. So again, Liberty Bonds. Did we get people to do it? Definitely. So again, we'll end there today. But again, do you guys see how we worked to make this war effort? It wasn't just, boom, let's go to war. There was a process in order for us to go to war. So again, that's it for today. I'll see you guys later.